עשר שנים האחרונות, מבין המרצים, אמיר גולדנטל, מהמעבדה של עידו קנטה, בבקשה.
Okay, so we saw that uh, the brain is constructed from unreliable elements that vary between themselves and the time, and immediately questions arise. Is, is it like a brain or not? Well, to answer this question, uh, we should uh, talk about reliability. Uh, well, what is reliability and how we can measure it? Well, we can measure, we can measure reliability from the time of response. Slow or fast response in a computer, we want the response to be exactly at the same time every time. Another aspect of reliability, we want the correct output. We want the output of a logic gate to be consistent with the, with the, with the truth table of, the, of this logic gate. Well, both of these criteria are made in a CPU. The CPU is reliable. What about the brain? Is the brain reliable? Well, to, to, to answer this question, we should talk about neuronal response latency. Before I will talk about it, I will make a brief stop and talk about the experimental method that were used in, in our laboratory. I was not in charge of these experiments. These experiments were made mainly by Ronnie Vardy and Hagar. And, and, and uh, any complicated questions regarding these experiments should be addressed to them after my talk in private. <laughs> Uh, so, in the laboratory we take a newborn rat, two, two days after it was born, we take a slice of its cortex, and we put the slice through some mechanical and enzymatic procedures to separate between tissues. Then, we play these uh, tissues on a multi-electrode array, and uh, we put the multi-electrode array in an incubator for two weeks. Then, after two weeks, we see the network is fully functional, health network with spontaneous activity. Well, let's talk about this multi-electrode array. Multi-electrode array is 2 squared centimeters. It has roughly 1 million neurons. It has 60 electrodes, in our case. Uh, every electrode is uh, 30 micrometers in diameter. And the gap between them is 200 or 500 micrometers. With this multi-electrode array, we are able to stimulate neurons and record their voltage. Uh, you can see the diagram of the experiment, the multi-electrode array amplifier in the computer. We measure the voltage of neurons in real time, and we give feedback to neurons in real time. Okay, so let's go back to our talk. Is the brain reliable? And to answer this, we will talk about neuronal response latency. What is neuronal response latency? Well, neuronal response latency is defined as a time pass from stimulation to spike detection. What does that mean? I stimulate a neuron, I measure the spike, and the time between the time passed from stimulation to a spike is a neuronal response latency. The neuronal response latency has a tendency to increase. So if I stimulate the neuron over and over again, it gets tired, and the neuronal response latency increases. So this is an example of experiment that can be made. You stimulate the neuron, you measure its neuronal response latency, you do it over and over again, and the neuronal response latency increases. This is measurements from, from, uh, from the laboratory. This is a stimulation in the red bar. And you see the spikes emitted, and every time it is more and more... Uh, the latency increases. Well, you see a graph of the latency as a function of number of stimulation given to a neuron. This is experimental results. You see that the latency increase is huge. In the beginning, the latency was 3.5 milliseconds. And in the end, it was 6 milliseconds, almost, almost twice the size in the initial time. So, we cannot ignore this fact that the latency increases. Uh, well, this, uh, this idea of latency increase uh, was known for uh, 50 years. You can see results uh, that talking about uh, the latency increase 50 years ago in the literature. However, our idea was to ask, well, how this affects in the circuit level? What happens, not in the single neuron level, what happens if you connect several neurons together? <coughs> this is a pretty simple example. We connect uh, two neurons, A and B. Neuron A is stimulating neuron B. That means that if I stimulate neuron B, neuron A, neuron A will fire and will stimulate neuron B to fire. I will define the delay, for, delay of this chain. Delay the time passed from the spike of neuron A to the spike of neuron B. It is clear that because the latency of each neuron increases, if I stimulate this chain over and over again, the delay of the chain will increase due to the effect of each neuron in this chain. And each neuron will contribute its own latency increase to the increase of the whole chain. So we see the increase of the chain thanks to the increase in the latency of neurons. You see experimental results here and the movement of this spike. 
And uh, this is a graph of the delay of the chain. In the beginning, the delay was 80 milliseconds. And as we gave more and more stimulations, the delay increased in about 2 milliseconds. Well, what happened if we take 5 neurons, for example, chain of 5 neurons, and not only 2 neurons? Because every neuron will contribute its own latency increase to the delay, the delay will increase much faster. So this is experimental measurements, and you see the graph of the delay. In the beginning it was 80 milliseconds, and in the end it was 85-86 milliseconds. This is an accumulative effect. The more neurons we have in the chain, the faster it will increase. I want you to remember this result because it will be important as we continue. So, on the single neuron level, we had an increase in the neuronal response latency. On the circuit level, we have an increase in chain delays. Well, so, what we see here actually is that the brain is not reliable. Elements change with time, they fire something in one time and then they, they increase their delay. So, the, the, the brain is not reliable as a computer. The computer, the elements are static. So, the questions arise. How can reliability be achieved using unreliable elements? I just showed you that neurons are unreliable. But I feel that my brain is pretty reliable. I'll give you a second to think about it because this uh, question should address every one of you. This is a very interesting question. We have unreliable elements and we have reliability in the end. How, how does this happen? Another question is, is it possible to build logic gates from neurons? Maybe I'm just, maybe it is not possible at all. And the third question is, if it is possible, what is the advantage of using such logic gates instead of the logic gates in the computer? Is there an advantage? Because we pay a lot of money, so our gates in the computer will be reliable. Maybe we don't need reliability in the, in the computer. These are the answers I would like to, uh, these are the questions I would like to answer in my talk. So, we get to a new type of logic gates. Uh, okay, we have uh, an example. Oh. I will uh, go through this example in detail. An end gate from, that is boiled from neurons. And let's see how it works. Every circle is a neuron. Every circle is a neuron. Uh, every arrow is a strong connection. And the dashed arrow is a weak connection under threshold stimulation. The, the, the other was above threshold stimulation. So if we stimulate neuron A, neuron A will fire. And we will probably stimulate neuron C to fire as well. What happens here? If neuron D fires, it will not stimulate neuron E to fire alone. It needs a friend. It needs some other weak stimulation to come with him. And the, there to be a special summation. So neuron E will fire only if and only if two weak spikes will arrive to him in a time gap that is short enough. So what happens in this case? In this case, the left chain is shorter than the right chain. And if we stimulate both of the neurons together, the spike from the left chain will arrive to neuron E a lot, a lot faster than the spike from the right chain. And neuron E will not fire. Okay, so neuron E will not fire, and we call it a null state because neuron E does not fire. So this was this example, where the left spike arrives earlier than the right spike, and we have a null state. Another example is when both of the delays are approximately the same size. In this case, the end, there is an end functionality, because both of, the, both of the spikes arrive approximately at the same time. And we see a spike from the output neuron. Uh, you see here both of the experimental measurements, two weak stimulations, and the spike. On the other case, here you have to, you see two weak stimulations, so the time gap is too, too large and there is no evoked spike. <coughs> Notice that in this case, if we stimulate only one of the neurons, obviously the output neuron will not fire because it is only one spike. In the third case, the, the right chain is much shorter than the left chain. And again, there will be no spike, because the spike from the right chain will arrive a lot, a lot earlier than the spike from the left chain. And this is experimental measurements again. So, is there a biological mechanism to pass from one state to another? It seems that the neural response latency does the work. If we take this left uh, first case, and we stimulate both of the chains together several times, the left chain will increase its delay a lot faster than the right chain, as we saw earlier. And because it is shorter, it will increase faster and it will arrive sometime to the case that both of the chains are approximately the same size. Again, if we stimulate both of the neurons together, the left chain will grow large faster than the right chain and we will again move to the third, third state where it will be a null state. So what I showed you here is a dynamical changing end gate. It was in the beginning some null state, then it was an end and then it was a null. It changed with time. This is not the case in the computer. In the computer, 
You have static, static logic gates, every one of them has its own functionality, and always it is the same functionality. In our case, we have dynamic transitions. We have dynamic transitions from several states. We have the first state, the second state, and the third state. We have, okay, here's an experiment testing this idea. Uh, we, were, we boiled this network in an in vitro experiment, and we measured the difference between two aerobic stimulations. In the beginning, the, the, the difference was, was large. It was this one and a half milliseconds, the difference in the delays. But as we continue to stimulating the gate, uh, the delay, the difference between stimulations became smaller as the left chain started to grow and get to the right chain. And then it overshoots, and again the time difference between two aerobic stimulations uh, becomes larger. I will show you this again, and this time I will show in purple lines that indicate the firing of neuron E. So we see that in the beginning there is no firing of neuron E, because it is in, in the null state. In the middle, the gate is in, the, in its end state, and as we stimulate both of the neurons, we see, as, we see firing of neuron E. And at the end, we see again no firing of neuron E, as it is in the, left, in the null state. This is the dynamic transition that was observed experimentally. So, we see here the truth table of the static logic gate in the computer. We see that uh, the end gate will have uh, one if only if both of the inputs are one. In our case, uh, okay, in our case it is the middle, it is, it is in the middle if both inputs are stimulated by the spike of neuron E. However, we have the time dependent end gate because in the start and in the end it is in, an, in the null state. Uh, so, we have made some more experiments. We tested the OR gate. In the OR gate, we, have, uh, we do not have under threshold stimulations, but we have strong stimulations. Uh, we tested the NOT gate. In the NOT gate, we have inhibitory stimulations instead of excitatory. Ronnie and the guy were smart enough to implement this kind of stimulations in the in vitro network. And we have the XOR, the XOR gate, which is a little bit more complicated. It has two inhibitory stimulations, but again, it was made experimentally. Uh, so I will uh, summarize the results of the experiments. In the left side you can see the truth tables of the end or not and XOR. On the right side you will see the dynamic logic operations of such dynamic logic gates. All of those, all those transitions were observed experimentally. You, we saw, for example, in the XOR case, OR, XOR, OR. In the beginning the gate was in the OR state, uh, similar to this state. Then it was in the XOR gate, changed its whole, its whole truth table to this one, and then again came back to the ORC or state. So we saw a transition of ORC or OR. We tested these results in, an, in, the popula in population dynamics using hodgkin axley model. And we saw that the results are robust to population dynamics. We reviewed distribution for the delays and for the connectivity. Uh, we have made some generalization for, uh, for this idea. As you know, the brain is not a so simple environment as I showed you. We not necessarily both of the inputs are stimulated at the same time. And uh, the first generalization was different timings for the inputs. Uh, what happens if the two inputs are not stimulated together? Uh, another, uh, another generalization that was made, what happened if we have multiple inputs? As we saw in the network earlier, we had several inputs to the same neuron. And that was also experiment, uh, not experiment, theoretically tested multiple inputs to a, to, a, to a gate. And the recurrent gate, where the output is transmitted to the input, it is never, it is not, it is, in our case it was exactly to the input, but it doesn't matter. If a gate is inside the network, there will be some recurrent connection. All those, all those generalizations were tested, and we saw multiple computational state, multiple computational transitions in all of those states, all of those cases. Actually, the dynamics was enriched, and we saw a lot more transitions between a lot more states. As you can see the example below, that is not properly seen. Uh, so what are the implications of such theory? Uh, because I only talked that there may, may be such logic gates, but what are the implications of such theory? Well, the first implication that we showed is edge detection. Uh, you can see the... You can see the architecture of this edge detector at the bottom. You see several end gates connected. Uh, we took this image, we passed it through the edge detector, and we, uh, we received this result from the neural edge detector. Uh, this is a computer edge detector, and you can see a success finding the edges. Another implication 
is using these gates as neuronal switches, because every gate has several states. If, for example, we take the end gate that had an R state and an end state, uh, we can uh, attach each state another state of the switch, for example, open as an end gate and closed as an R gate. <coughs> using this idea, we were able to bridge two different schools in neuroscience. As we all know, we can encode information in a neuronal network using rate code or firing code. That means changing in the rate of firing of a single neuron or changing in the firing synchrony between several neurons. Those two phenomena seem completely uncorrelated. We showed that both of these, both of these things can be uh, connected together and we showed how a neuron can change its rate, double its rate actually, and in the same time, go inside the inside firing synchrony, complete synchrony, uh, in, the, in the same moment that it, it, it doubled its rate. Uh, there, are some, there are still some open questions left. Uh, the first open question that is left is how many different states can a system have? We'll take, for example, this system. You can see a logic gate here. And uh, it has, for example, six states. See the states here. <laughs> And so, because each gate has some states, we have uh, multiple pictures here, that each, each picture is connected to another, uh, another, another states of, uh, of, the, of the logic gates. So, how many states of this, how many pictures can we have within this dynamics? How many pictures can we pass? This is an open question. Another very interesting open question is what kind of Markov, of Markov process will describe such, uh, such a dynamic, such dynamics? In the, in the simple static case, we had the Markov matrix, uh, we had the static matrix, and we all know how to, how, how to mathematically work with such matrix. But in our case, the delays change with time, and we should have matrix that changes with time. Its size should change with time, and its values should change with time. So we have a time-dependent transition matrix. And personally, I, I don't know how to deal with such matrices and such uh, processes. It is very interesting. So if we can find some general uh, general conclusions, knowing such dynamics of such matrices. Uh, another interesting open question is this new logic of the brain is beyond Turing machine. Uh, in the old uh, case of McCulloch and Pitts, uh, the, the brain was actually uh, logic gates and uh, several states and it was exactly like the Turing machine, which is discrete and in the time and in the space. However, this new logic of the brain is continuous in time and space. As a uh, neuron can fire whenever it wants, and uh, each changes its delays, delays are time dependent, and we have uh, its voltage and every and all those uh, states of the neuron. So, is this new brain logic is within Turing paradigm or not? If yes, so again we are back to the idea maybe our brain is like a computer. If not, that, well, our brain is uh, one heck of, uh, of a machine. Oh, I would like to summarize my talk. Uh, I would like to summarize my talk with a question that uh, should regard everyone that sits, uh, that sits here, everyone that wants to know how the brain works. And the question is, what is the meaning of understanding in neuroscience? Well, we all want to understand the brain. However, how do we do that? What is the meaning of understanding? Uh, one can say that we should uh, understand lower levels before areas in the brain. Maybe to understand this, we need to understand large networks on small networks, maybe we should go even lower and understand the single neuron level, or even lower to the ion channels and understand them. Maybe we should understand every molecule in the brain or every atom in the brain. From what level should we try to understand the brain? I will give you a second to think about it. If understanding, meaning finding a mechanism, so what kind of mechanism should I look for? A mechanism that describes phenomena on some level from the most basic level? Or should I start from some, some level in the middle and go rise from there? And if so, from what level should I start? From a single neuron ion channels? I really don't know that answer. Maybe someone can tell me, but I really don't know. And uh, I would like to explain our approach for this question and uh, what the approach that I used in uh, my research. So, our approach was this. We found a phenomenon on the, some level. In our case, it was a neuronal level. And we had, and in our case, the neuronal response latency was uh, the phenomenon. We had completely no understanding of the mechanism. Well, we do understand that 
this, this uh, phenomenon may be caused by uh, depolarization of the cell or something like that, but we do not know exactly how the latency will increase. We cannot predict these fluctuations, and the whole phenomenon is not completely understandable to us, or at all. Uh, and personally, I'm not qualified to answer what is the mechanism for such phenomenon. However, without understanding the mechanism to drive this, this, drive this phenomenon, we, we try to explain new phenomena in higher levels. We were able to understand epochs of synchrony that appear in, in a network. We were able to bridge between synchrony and firing rate, two different schools in neuroscience. Uh, we were able to find mechanisms that cause non-local synchrony. Uh, Hai will talk about non-local synchrony in, her next, in the next talk. And we were able to understand this new logic of the brain and answer a very interesting question that I asked you before, is the brain, or is the brain is like a computer? And we were able to show that the brain is not like a computer. The brain is dynamically changing, it has dynamic units, and the, the logic is not the same static logic of conventional computers. Well, thank you very much. Any ideas, questions would be welcome. Yes. Regarding what you... Questions? Yes. Regarding what uh, if I may, as the chair of this session, if somebody has oh. a question, you should stand up oh, and say your name. Okay. And who, who are you working for? <laughs> for Barland University. No, 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 I'm no, from no. the machine. Who's your mentor? Um, I supervise students and also work with Professor Netanyahu. Um, I'm from the field of computer machine learning. Regarding what you mentioned about the unreliability of neurons, Actually, in computer machine learning, in many computer vision problems right now, the state of the art is achieved by deep layers of neural network. And the most interesting thing is that in, during the past year, the most important breakthrough was that if we use dropout, that is, we randomly turn off some of the neurons in our network, the result gets only better. If we introduce unreliability to our computer model, the result improves. And something my, one of my students did last week, and we're going to publish it, is we tried doing 99% unreliability. That is, like in a computer neural network, at each moment we randomly turn off 99% of neurons. Completely unreliable. The overall result remains the same, but is more robust and generalizes better. So maybe what the unreliability of the brain is actually an improvement, since we are using it in computers and it only improves our results. So maybe it's a blessing and not a curse. Uh, well, to begin with, this idea is very interesting. I will leave even like to hear more about it later. Uh, however, uh, the unreliability mentioned here is a little bit different. The unreliability you mentioned is a little bit, uh, it's a little bit uh, close to the unreliability mentioned by uh, one human. Uh, it is when, when, uh, when neurons do not fire or uh, logic gates uh, get confused. In our case, there was a state that the logic gate acted like one case, and then it turned into another one. And it is not that it has 99% to fire wrong, and it is not that we are trying to understand the static case with some unreliability. We get to a completely new case, where changing gates with thanks to this reliability. Of course, it may be good, it may be... We can add here this unreliability that neurons will, would not fire. A similar idea is also, instead of just turning off neurons, making some of the neurons just fire random noise, and it also improves some of the models. And not only fire them, but just firing random, random noise. Any other question? Yes? Stand up, stand up, don't be shy. State your name. The question is about forms of animal ability. You showed us that the animal ability is in the model in the experimental data is related to latency. And you showed it when you increase, I guess, when a mysterious appears more and more time, the latency increases. Yes. Uh, this can be considered a reliability, and one can also look at it for example, the constant output of the example, derivative. So if you put a, if you, that you have to increase the mysterious frequency in order to maintain a constant fire rate, a constant, uh, a constant, late, a constant latency. So my question is what about unreliability of the randomness, the neural firing or not? Well, in our case, in our case, do you want to continue? In our case, uh, this unreliability was not discussed. It may be enrich and enhance our dynamics. Uh, however, this unreliability that you talk about can be neglected in the population dynamic case, where each node here is 
uh, others as a whole population, and the unreliability of misfiring decreases. So I'm not sure if this kind of unreliability uh, donates to the dynamics of these logic gates or this idea. It may enhance, but we did not discuss it yet. Any more? Yes? I've got yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I'm just to standing up. That's what the chair asked. <laughs> Fight later. I, I try to speak up. He runs faster. <laughs> uh, so, there are a lot of mechanisms described in the literature. This really is the literature. Okay, yes, yes. Last question. Yeah. Um, about short term plasticity and dynamics. And I was wondering if you can say a few more details about first, how common was this effect? In what fraction of the neurons did you actually find? <coughs> The, the, the gates changing dynamically, and also, what are the time scales? Uh, how how many times do you need to repeat simulation at this okay. happens? And because this could help us understand if some of the known uh, short and plastic mechanisms could explain the, the what is. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, all neurons, all neurons show increase in the latency, and all neurons show large increase in the latency. Maybe one in thousand will not show. I'm not, I don't know. I'm not in the laboratory, but I know that neurons increase their latency always, and thus always you will see these gate transitions because it is only based on the increase on the latency. Um, at the time scales, uh, the neural latency increase in 800 stimulations, where each stimulation can be given from a uh, five hertz to 100 hertz, and it will always increase. At the higher frequencies, it will increase slightly faster uh, in terms of stimulations. It, I mean, in 100 hertz, after 500 stimulation, you will reach this maximum. Well, in 10 hertz, it will take you like 1,000 stimulations. And you can t take the time so you need it here. Any other questions? Well, if none, I just thank the speaker again.